Hi there. Here's my new agent, Miss Rickett. Hi, Suleiman. Uh, hi, Susan. How are you? Good. How are you? Oh, good. Thanks. Yeah. I'm going to wait a couple minutes to see if anybody else hops on. Thanks, you guys, for being here. On the um, calendar tab where it shows that my class, when the class is, you can click on that link and it will take you, um, you can open um, attachments and that'll give you all the forms that we're going to talk about today. Um, and ne next time I promise I will learn to share documents on uh, my screen. <laughs> But for today, you can either access them through the link or alternatively, you can go on the MLS to express forms and look at the forms as we're talking about them. Sometimes that's helpful to kind of follow along. Oh, here's Chris. Uh, Chris coming on. Hey, Chris. Hello. Hello, how are you? Doing well, how about yourself? Oh, I'm doing okay. I've still got a, a lingering cough, so I might have to stop and drink some water occasionally during the course of the, during the class. It's just annoying. Okay. I'm going to wait about two more minutes before we get started. I'll grab something off the printer. Okay. Okay, I'm going to try and keep an eye on the um, waiting room, make sure I don't miss anybody else that comes in if they're a few minutes late. But in the meantime, um, I wanted to see if you guys wanted to talk a little bit about the new requirements coming January 1st um, that's going to deal with the buyer brokerage agreement when providing brokerage services and see if anybody had questions about the um, Form 41, the Exclusive Buyer's Agency Agreement, which we are using in all our buyer transactions as a matter of company policy and best practices. Um, this, so there will be more education um, about the changes to the law um, that take place on January 1st, 2024, that's going to require um, this uh, as a matter of law in every transaction that you work with a buyer. And it will need to be signed by your client as soon as reasonably practical. Um, and the big, big change in my mind is that if we don't do it, then we're in violation of Washington's agency law. And that would make a broker subject to civil liability and regulatory discipline. And they would be prohibited from collecting um, compensation in the transaction if they fail to have that exclusive buyer's agency agreement signed. 
so it basically says the form that we have now, um, and it may be revised um, in the in the coming weeks here, but I haven't gotten a firm answer on that. But basically, it appoints um, the broker as the principal or the buyer's uh, agent and specifies that the buyer is acknowledging the receipt of the law of real estate agency pamphlet. And that's supposed to be redone too, because it, it really isn't very user friendly at this point, as far as civilians reading it. Um, so hopefully they'll make it a little uh, easier to understand for the clients. And then it shows what areas the buyer's broker is going to um, look for property for the buyer. Um, if you don't fill it in, it's unlimited. And um, a lot of people won't fill it in or they'll say South Sound or Greater Seattle or something kind of broad because a lot of times you are looking in a rather large area. And then it creates an exclusive agency relationship between the buyer and the broker and means that we have the exclusive right to represent that client. And then it deals, of course, with <laughs> there's a term of agreement. The default is 120 days, but you can write in any amount of time there, depending on what you and the buyer agree to. And then it mentions compensation, what the buyer broker is going to get paid. And usually we put in a percent of the purchase price. And really what this allows the buyer's broker to do is to negotiate with the seller on the amount of compensation they're going to receive. So in the past, whatever was in the listing um, was what the buyer broker got paid. And if there was, say the buyer broker said, I work for 3% and the listing said, we'll pay two and a half, then you had the option of filling in that compensation from the buyer to make up the difference between what you charge and what the seller's offering. Now you can also, when you write an offer, you can ask the seller to pay the commission that you charge. Just like when they, so it essentially it converts the buyer's the buyer's broker's compensation to be a closing cost to the buyer. So just like you can negotiate on price or a closing cost with a seller, you can also negotiate on your compensation. Suleiman, do you have any other specific questions about the use of this form? Uh, no, no, I don't have. Yeah. Just wanted to wanted a big overview, and I think you, you answered all the questions I had. Okay. Um, there's a lot more legalese <laughs> involved, but um, yeah, if you get to the point where you're ready to fill one out and you have more questions, you can always contact me, but we'll probably, once we get more information on if, the, if there's going to be a revision to this and a revision to the law of agency document itself, then again, we'll have, there'll be some educational opportunities either, you know, through the MLS or through me or both. And so there'll be more information coming and we'll be going over this um, again. <laughs> We've got some time. We've got a little over three months yet before that all, before that law goes into effect. But still, everybody should be using this form with every buyer that you work with. And let me just say that everybody who's been in business for any length of time in real estate has a story of buyer betrayal. And while it's unfortunate, um, it does happen. I'm minimizing my email so I'm not distracted. So we're going to go through some of the commonly used addenda today. Um, do you want a list of what all we're going to look at, or do you want to just have me tell as, as we go along? We're going to do kind of the 22 series, um, the financing and all, all the addenda there, 
Optional clauses is an important one. Title contingency. Um, I really don't talk too much about short sale agenda because there are so few of them in the market right now. And I will say that if you end up with a short sale listing, you should partner up with somebody who was in business um, back when we had a lot of this this kind of distressed property on the market um, because it's a very specific skill set that's developed over time. It's kind of the, the Henry Ford uh, philosophy of um, efficiency. You do one thing over and over again and you get really good at it. But you wouldn't want to do one just a one off and not have any any help because it involves negotiating with the bank and um, different banks have different requirements. So it's it's very specific. Then we're also going to talk about 22 EF evidence of funds. Um, the lead based paint disclosure addendum and also um, utilities addendum. So we're going to start with 22A, which is, of course, the financing addendum. And there are many other addenda that can be used in different scenarios, like the home sale contingency addendum 22B, but I tried to focus on the most commonly used addenda, ones that we're going to use you know, kind of over and over again in standard residential purchase sale transactions. Remember that each of the addenda that you use on a contract, you're going to want to um, list on your form 21, your purchase and sale on line 16, and that you want to have each of the addenda that you use listed there. <clears throat> And also remember that there's a real temptation for brokers to use a, a blank addendum, Form 34, for different scenarios, but we um, that's it's very difficult to write a complete and legally binding addendum. So we have over 100 firms in the statewide system, and more often than not, when I get a call from people saying, hey, Here's my situation. What form do I use for this? I can almost always find a form that's specific to that. Once in a great while, we'll use a blank notice or a blank addendum, but most of the time we can find an addendum that's going to fit the bill for a specific scenario. So if you get into that situation and you can't figure out which form to use, call your mentor or call me and we'll help you identify the correct form to use. It really makes a big difference in terms of limiting the liability for you, your client, and the firm. So 22A, let's start there. So this we use to make the buyer's offer contingent on obtaining funds from a loan to make the purchase. The boilerplate language in the Form 21 says that the buyer is going to pay cash. So in order to have this contingency for your buyer, you have to use Form 22A, the financing addendum. The first part of the form gives you the opportunity to fill in what kind of loan your buyer is going to get. So prior to putting your buyer in the car to go shopping, you're going to want to have a pre-approval letter from the lender, and that will tell you what kind of loan they're going to get. Don't guess. If you don't know, um, or if you think, you know, we don't know if it's going to be conventional or FHA. Call your lender and find out before you fill out the form. One thing they've recently changed is they've added a, a new loan type, which is the down a down payment program. So any kind of down payment assistance would be, um, there's a box for that now to check. 
Now, if you simply want to disclose that the buyer is relying on um, non-contingent funds, then you would use a 22 EF, and that's an evidence of funds form. So what does this contingency mean to your buyer? Well, essentially, I mean, they're, we're going to go through the details, but if they can't get their loan after a good faith effort on their behalf or on their part, then they can get out of their transaction and get their earnest money back. Without this contingency, their earnest money isn't protected. And if they can't complete the purchase without this contingency, they'd sacrifice their earnest money because they'd be in default of their contractual agreement. Oh, I'm not doing too well. My nose is really running. <laughs> there's, in addition to the loans, there's a place for you to fill in how much of a down payment the buyer is actually going to make. So this is only the cash that's coming out of their pocket. If they are getting a down payment, getting funds from a down payment program, you do not fill in that amount here. You only fill in any dollar amount that the buyer is actually going to pay out of their own account, not as part of a down payment program. So there are ways that the buyer can lose their contingency. And one of the ways is if they don't make their application for their loan within the agreed upon time, which is five days as a default, or if they change the type of loan at any time without the seller's prior written consent, or they change the lender without the seller's prior written consent after the agreed upon time for financing. So within that five days after mutual, they've got to make their loan application and pick with their chosen lender. Now, to change a type of loan at any time during the course of the transaction, they've got to have the seller's written consent. So that form is 22AC. And why is this important? Why would the seller care about these, these items? Well, if your typical closing times for a loan uh, are based on type, so a standard conventional loan is going to take about 30 days. FHA can take 40. VA can take 45. So if the buyer changes a type of loan during the course of the transaction, it's most likely going to impact the closing date. And of course, the seller is going to want to know about that um, so they can adjust their, their own timeline and their logistical plans for moving, right? So remember that that first five days, they've got to lock, pick their lender and apply for their loan. And then they um, they have to basically stick with that unless they get prior written consent from the seller. Now, one thing that a lot of people miss on this form <laughs> is that in paragraph 1B, it says, buyer authorizes listing broker and seller to inquire about buyer's loan, status of buyer's loan approval with the lender anytime prior to closing. And if the lender requires, the buyer will execute an authorization form to release that information to the listing broker and seller. So that means if you're the listing broker, you have the contractual right to follow up with the buyer's lender to find out how they're doing with their loan. And you should absolutely do this. You know, have they finished their loan application? Where are they in the approval process? When is the loan going to underwriting? Are we going to make our closing date? That kind of thing. That's part of your due diligence and it also makes you look really good to your seller client if you are the listing agent because you can give them status reports on how the buyer's loan is progressing and let them know that, you know, we're on track for closing. They've submitted everything they need. And now that we're through the inspection period, the 
appraisal has been ordered and we should have it in five days. You know, just give them regular updates. Information is definitely uh, power in this situation. So very important to keep up on the lender's process, um, whichever side you're on, whether you're a listing broker or the selling broker, so that you know that you're on track for um, to meet your closing date. <laughs> So let's talk just for a minute about 22 AA, which is an appraisal addendum. Now we do have a, we'll go over on, on page two on the financing addendum. There is a provision for if the appraisal comes in less than sales price, what the options are, but there is also a freestanding form 22 AA. So if that's, just an appraisal contingency. Well, when would you ever use this? Well, say you have an investor, maybe they have a hard money lender, maybe they're a flipper, something like that, or a cash buyer, but they still wanna make sure that um, the property's at the value that they want it to be. So they want a contingency based on the appraisal. You can use 22AA for that. And it's if you have a cash buyer and investor, it's always good to suggest that. However, they do have to pay for the appraisal. So if they don't want it, they don't have to have it, but it does exist and it's not a bad idea at all to, to utilize that. You can at least suggest it to your cash buyer and it protects you as well as your clients. Okay, so switching back to 22A, a lot of people make the mistake when they put down the amount of the down payment that this buyer's going to make, they'll put down the most that they think the buyer's going to make. You should always put down the minimum. What's the minimum requirement from the lender? Most loans are going to require the buyer to put down X amount of money, right? So always put the minimum. A lot of times we've had some conflicts where people have lost their financing contingency because um, it was put down that they would put down, you know, 25%. And then when they got the terms of their loan after their application, they realized they could only afford to put down 20%. And since that didn't match what was on the 22A, um, they, they had no contingency anymore. Uh, it didn't, because of, the contingency is based on the loan as it's described on this form. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Okay, paragraph two is divided into two choices, A and B, for the buyer to choose from. Um, a is the seller's notice to perform. And it says that the buyer has 21 days after mutual acceptance to get their financing approved. And if they don't give notice to the seller that financing is ready, the seller can send 22 AR to the buyer and honestly, the seller should do this. It kind of says, buyer, you should have your financing in order by now. And we want you to waive the financing contingency. And um, if the buyer does not want to do that, they can actually deliver notice of termination to the buyer after three days have passed. Prior to that third day, the buyer can check the box on the AR, that's 22A, the financing addendum response, and waive their financing contingency. Now, if the buyer is denied financing by the lender, then you would use Form 90I, 
to provide notice that the buyer's loan had been denied. And paragraph four deals with that um, possibility. And it says that if buyer hasn't waived the financing contingency and is unable to obtain financing by closing after a good faith effort, then on buyer's notice, which is provided on 90I, agreement shall terminate. Earnest money shall be refunded to buyer after lender confirms in writing the date that the buyer made their loan application, a copy of the loan estimate that was provided to buyer, that buyer possessed sufficient non-contingent funds to close, in other words, their down payment, and the reasons buyer couldn't get their financing. So that's you know reason for the denial. So this is really important because these this documentation has to accompany your notice or your buyer isn't contractually entitled to the refund of their earnest money. So there are those four things, the date of the loan application, the copy of the loan estimate, the buyer had their down payment, and why they were denied. And then you would send that, you get that information from the buyer's lender, you send it over with a 90I, which is a notice to the seller saying, buyer couldn't get their loan, along with a form 50, which is authorization to disperse earnest money. And you send that over to the listing agent. Um, you know, very unfortunate, but buyer is unable to get their loan. Here's the required documentation. Please return the form 50 when it's signed by your seller so we can get it over to escrow. <coughs> and even though the buyer's contractually entitled to the return of the earnest money, Escrow is going, going to want something in writing that shows that the parties agree on the distribution of earnest money. And honestly, the, the seller is aware um, that this is happening. While escrow is a neutral third party, they do have a responsibility to each of the parties and they can't execute instructions unilaterally. They've got to have something in writing that shows that the parties agree on this action. So that's why that's necessary. But I can't tell you how many times I have gone through this paragraph four with experienced agents who will all, they will just send over like a rescission um, and say, oh, um, you know, financing failed. We need the earnest money back. Well, that's not adequate to fit the requirements. So you've got to do all, send all four of these things plus the notice and the earnest money authorization um, to disperse in order for your buyer to get that earnest money back. And believe me, they will want it back like yesterday if their loan falls apart. Maybe they'll try to buy something else, but most people are not happy having to wait around for earnest money. So make sure that you, you've got that paragraph four down. Otherwise, if you just send one thing and not the other, or you send a few of the things, or you just provide it anecdotally in an email, you know what? Seller isn't going to release that earnest money. So make sure that you adhere to that. Super, super important. So going back to the financing contingency on page one, paragraph two, there is a default. I, you, you have the option of selecting either the seller's notice to perform or automatic waiver of financing contingency. My recommendation would always be to check the first one. And it does default to A if you don't check anything. And then where it says appraisal less than sales price, buyer's waiver of the financing contingency will or will not waive the appraisal less than sales price. Always check will not. You always want to preserve as many contingencies as you can for your buyer. Have you guys written a, a purchase and sale yet? Either of you, Chris or Sulemar? Uh, not yet. I'm hoping to practice one uh, by the end of the week. And then you're going to go over that with your mentor? Yes, yes. Have they given you? Well, I think maybe in your new agent handbook, they had like some scenarios for um, transactions to practice on, like, you know, John and Mary Green, a married couple, want to buy a house in Kent, and it's, you know, 
you want to offer this much and put down this much earnest money and this is their they're getting a conventional loan and putting 15% down. Gives you all the variables so that you can practice filling that in. Oh, okay. Have okay. you seen that in your new agent? Uh, no, I don't have that. You don't have the new agent orientation book? Or you don't have the, the binder? Is that what you're talking about? The yeah. binder? Oh, yeah. oh yeah. okay. Okay. I have it. I have it checked. So there might be some practice um, okay. scenarios in there, but if you can't find it, you could ask your mentor to you know give give you the specifics they want to practice transaction you know give me uh, the give me the things that i'll need to fill in so that i can practice filling them in and then you can actually go on transaction desk and you know create a, tra a test transaction you know um you could even put a silly name on it you know like mickey and minnie mouse or something so you don't get it confused with with any right actual transaction that you might create later. But that's super good practice. And then also your mentor should be looking at your offers, um, any of your documents um, in your first three transactions before they go out for signing. And, you know, when I was a new agent, we didn't have a mentor program, but I did work with my broker for the first year. When she had recruited me into the firm, it was very experienced. And it was a great comfort to me to have another set of eyes on my documents before they went out, especially if we were, oh, say in an inspection negotiation and we had to word things very carefully. I wanted to make sure that it was proper before it went out um, and that I hadn't missed anything. You know, there are a lot of pages to these transactions. Used to be a, a you know, maybe, you know, eight, 10 pages. Now they're routinely, you know, 25 to 30, right? So there are a lot of pages, a lot of agenda, and a lot of boxes to check. And it doesn't hurt to have another set of eyes on your transaction to make sure that you haven't missed anything that might might lose your buyer a contingency or, um, or not have the intended result. So the other option other than seller's notice to perform is the automatic waiver of the contingency so that means that after 21 days no more your buyer doesn't have that contingency anymore so that means if they default on the transaction they don't get their earnest money back the contingency is um, done if they if the buyer terminates prior to that 21 days then the earnest money goes back to the buyer as long as you uh, follow the magical paragraph four. And again, I would not waive my appraisal less than sales price contingency. Um, check that box for will not. And that is the default too um, on that. So that's a little bit of um, extra protection for you. Okay, page two, top of the page, we've got um, a blank there for this amount that the seller would contribute to the buyer's closing costs. Now, how do you know how much closing costs the buyer's going to need, if any? Conversation with your buyer's lender before you write the offer. So I would have, um, <clears throat> I'd have, you know, a sheet of, sheet of paper, make some notes for yourself somehow. These are the things I need to know from the listing agent when I'm writing an offer. These are the things I need to know from the buyer's lender when I'm writing an offer. And we talked about when you're filling out the purchase and sale, you know, you talk, we talked about response time from the seller. We talked about a realistic closing date from the lender, um, what the buyer can is approved for, getting a pre-approval letter that matches your offer. And of course, we need how much earnest money is going to be put down, all of those things. And then we also need to know if the buyer needs those closing costs, and if so, how much. And those have to be, the reason it's important to have this um, from the lender, not from the buyer only, is that the lender has to, these, these costs have to be approved by the lender in order to be applied. So if you say, oh, we'll just ask for $20,000, but 
the buyer can only use $15,000 of it. How do you think the buyer's going to feel when he gets his settlement statement and sees he's getting 5000 less credit? He's not going to be happy. So get that information from the, from the beginning. Now, if you're, if you've reached, either your buyer has elected to waive the financing contingency during the transaction or the 21 days has elapsed and the contingency is completed, waiving that contingency doesn't change the seller's obligation for certain loan and settlement costs in the provision. So this, this stays even if the financing contingency has elapsed. So that's good to know because you can count on that being there. <laughs> we talked about paragraph four. So paragraph five deals with appraisal less than sales price. So what happens if the buy, buyer's lender's appraisal comes in and it's less than the sales price? Well, buyer has to give notice, right? So you have to tell the seller about it. And that's a notice of low appraisal. And let me tell you which one that is. Twenty two A N. So it would be twenty two A for financing contingency and N for notice. So because seller's not gonna know, right? They're not they're not getting things directly from the uh, buyer's lender. So within three days of that receipt getting that low appraisal, buyer has to give the twenty two A N to the seller and say, Hey, the appraisal came in low. So then seller has within ten days. What can they do? Well, they can challenge the appraisal and ask for another one to be done if they have different information that's going to strengthen um, their case. And if you do end up having to do that, listing agent can really help a lot because they've run a lot of comps in order to establish the sales price initially. And they can provide a lot of documentation to you if you're the uh, buyer's agent and you're seeking to get that appraisal redone. If that is uh, not the chosen option or if it fails, and I've done that a couple times and honestly it didn't work either time, but you know, I felt it was worth a shot. Then the seller can bring the purchase price down to the appraised amount or they can bring it down some and the buyer can make up the difference in cash. The buyer can make up the whole difference in cash or guess what? Deal falls apart. Because if the appraisal and the sales price don't uh, match up and the funds aren't applied to make that work, buyer can't get their loan. So deal falls apart and buyer would get their earnest money back. So <clears throat> There's a whole process outlined in this addendum for appraisal as a sales price, the buyer giving notice to the seller, then the seller responding within 10 days. And then after the seller's response, buyer has again, three days to either waive their contingency and, or terminate the agreement or accept what the seller has done. If, they, if the seller says, okay, it appraised for five thousand less than sales price. I'll reduce the, the sales price by five thousand. Usually, then this the buyer says, "Great, let's go ahead, let's close." But if seller says, "No, I'm not going to reduce it, or I'm only going to reduce it by a thousand, and you have to make up the difference," then the buyer has three days to say, "I'm either yes, I'm going to buy it at the reduced price, or no, I'm going to terminate it," and then they get their earnest money back. And then the next paragraph deals with seller permission for appraisals and inspect, inspections required by the lender. And this is kind of interesting because um, sometimes with appraisals, there are work orders attached. And that means that the appraiser wants certain things on the property fixed. It may be 
safety issues. It might be an electrical panel. It might be structural issues. So if if those work orders are attached to the appraisal, then <coughs> within three days of getting those, buyer has to tell seller about them. <coughs> and then seller has the option of curing those by completing the requested repairs. Now, notice that they have the option, they're not required to do so. But if seller does not complete the, the work orders before closing, buyer can't get their loan and they get out with their earnest money. If buyer do, if seller does do the work orders, then happy, happy, joy, joy, we go on to close. Everything's um, completed and a reappraisal takes or a, a reinspection takes place and um, all the terms have been satisfied. So that, that means the buyer can get their loan. So to give a notice of an appraisal work order, that's 22A. So again, that's the number name, uh, number and letter for our financing addendum, and then WO, and that stands for work order. Now, a lot of times the forms are coded that way, so you can kind of figure out which one you're supposed to use. But if you're looking for a response form or a notice for a specific addendum, you can usually, like if it's something to do with financing, you can just put in 22 in your search bar and express forms, and it'll come up with every form that has 22 in it. And then you can read the titles of all of those. Because a lot of times I can't re remember the exact wording of an addendum, and so I'll just put in the number, and then I can look at all the options and select the correct one. Okay, any questions? comments the rest of the chris you look like you're about to say something are you doing okay uh yeah i'm good um i'm going to be doing a listing here soon so i kind of need to practice on these and i was wondering um outside of your mentor if there was you know a way to practice them you said transaction desk is there just like a a blank file or somewhere i could just file those away for practice purposes um, sure, you can, like I said, you can create kind of a test transaction for yourself um, just to practice filling out those forms. Or if you want to do it by hand, you can print the forms and, um, you know, fill them out by hand. But probably you'll be doing them, like most people like to create a transaction on transaction desk. In your case, it wouldn't matter if you did whichever way you did it, because one of the advantages of using transaction desk is if you put in the MLS number, then all the information in the MLS already auto populates on every form that you select, you know, like the property address and the name of the seller and, you know, the, the, the other brokers um, information and that kind of thing. But if you're doing a, you know, Mickey and Minnie Mouse kind of a transaction, then without a real MLS number, then that wouldn't matter. I mean, you could, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know. You could ask uh, what appeals to you better: um, doing it by hand or creating a transaction transaction desk. Probably transaction desk. It seems more uh, streamlined. And you want to practice on the purchase and sale forms, or on the listing forms to start with. Probably. Well, my first one will be a listing, so I'll probably start there. And this is when when you're. Listing your own property is the one that's coming up. Yeah, I was going to do it last week, but uh, probably, gosh, tomorrow I want to go live. On your listing? Yeah. And you've got your photos and everything? everything? I got photos. Yep, I'm clean. Oh. I got the sign delivered. So I think it's the next step is just getting all my forms together, filled out, and then uploading it to the MLS. Right. So you can input all that on your own, or you can fill out the forms and send it to listing input at MLS.com and they will input it for you. But it usually does take them a day. Okay. So I, I would start working on it as soon as you're done with the class. Okay. Yeah. Now remember, does it, take, does it take a while to input it yourself? 
Well, for I would say for the first time, yeah, because you're basically copying over everything that's on that listing input form and putting it into the system. Yeah. So it does take a, a bit of time. But remember that, um, like, if you're going to send it into the MLS for them to do it, you can put in, you know, really complete marketing remarks. But if you can just... Even if if you think you might want to refine them later, you can always edit your listing later. Okay. So if you if something comes to you like, oh, I didn't talk about the bonus room or something, or that should be a feature, or or that looks really good in the picture, I should mention that. Um, you can always go in and edit your own listing. You know. But, okay. Uh, yeah, I think I like the idea of inputting it myself, but uh, you said you could email it to who is it? E MLS? Listing input at nwmls.com. Okay. And they okay. usually quote a 24 hour turnaround, but but Thursday is a good day to, to get things listed because Thursday and Friday, selling brokers are looking for new listings on the MLS to take people out to show on the weekend. So Thursday is kind of a popular day for getting new listings on in, on the system. Okay. Um, the rest of the financing addendum deals with <clears throat> FHA, VA, USDA loans. And that says that if there's a low appraisal, um, a buyer isn't obligated to continue with the with the purchase. And the VA mandatory clause used to be a separate document, and now it's incorporated into this one form. And then finally, there's an automatic extension of the closing date um, if the lender the lender has to give a refined estimate of closing costs to the buyer, and they have three days to review it. So if the lender sends that out late, the buyer still gets three days to review it, and that automatically pushes your closing date out. You don't need an extension for that. This paragraph um, provides for that. And that's really a result of the Dodd-Frank Act that Oh gosh, I think it was 2009 um, that required the more transparency in the lending industry and more time for consumers to review documents. So that's the history on that one. Okay, well, I usually take a break around this time. Um, and why don't we, it's all about 10 till, so why don't we come back at five after? Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Sounds. Good. I forget to mention I'm at the library. If I don't hear something, there is some noise. Oh, okay. I better talk yeah. quietly then. Uh, uh, no, I can hear you, but sometimes there is a little noise around me. Oh, okay. I yeah. can. Uh, thanks. All right. See you soon.
Oh, hi. Hey. Oh, now we've lost Chris. Yes, I don't know if he's. I don't know if he's coming back from the uh, wedding room. Oh, I'll see if I don't see anybody in the waiting room. Oh. Did he go back to the waiting room? Uh, I'm I'm not sure. I think last time we were, she, he left and then he came back to the waiting room. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I was talking to Gwen about your question for regarding the um, the practice transaction. Or we were talking about that earlier, you and Kristen. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And she said not only could you do a uh, test transaction in Transaction Desk, but you could actually up upload a practice transaction to command. You know, just label oh, okay. it test. Oh, okay. That'd be awesome. So that would be a, a good um, a good exercise for you okay. to do. Okay. I have a Thank feeling. Um, Chris may have gone to work on his listing because yeah. <laughs> we're talking about the timing of that. And if he wants to go live tomorrow, it's already after three. So yeah. So we will um, we'll go through a few more. Honestly, I'm uh, I'm I I think we'll have a rather abbreviated class today because I'm uh, having to blow my nose every five minutes and um, it's really annoying. <laughs> I'm sure it's not fun for you. To <laughs> so we've kind of finished up um, our financing addendum and some of the additional agenda that go along with that, like the appraisal addendum and the um, increased down payment for low appraisal and so forth. So next, I want to talk about 22D. That's optional clauses. And this is a form that really you should use with every residential purchase. It has a lot of uh, goodies on here, a lot of um, necessary clauses for um, to limit liability and protections for your client. So paragraphs, do you have the option of looking at this? Did you click on the link or um, pull it up? Yes. Okay. yes, but I got lost a little bit. Is that which page on it? Um, this is 22D, D as in David. Okay, 22D. Optional clauses. Okay, yep, I found it. Uh, yeah, 22. 22D, yep, optional hmm. clauses. So, paragraphs 1, 3, and 4 should always be checked by the buyer's agent when you're writing an offer. And that protects the clients, the brokers, and the brokerages. Um, leaving these unchecked would, you know, give you some legal exposure that that we don't want. Um, for example, the first box with square footage. You know, we we don't measure the square footage of the house. We don't measure the square footage of the lot, um, and we can't evaluate encroachments on the property or on adjacent properties. So that's that's something the buyer really needs to verify on their own. And of course there are public records, but you know, when you have an appraisal, um, usually that information is verified at that time too. So that's um, kind of something that the buyer needs to verify on their own. So always do check that. Yeah. And paragraph three, Having the seller clean the interiors of this uh, of any structures and taking out the trash, debris, and rubbish from the property prior to buyer taking possession. Um, very basic, very important. And all, likewise, paragraph four, having the seller remove any personal property from uh, the property that's being uh, purchased prior to possession date. You know, buyer doesn't want their stuff on there unless they've agreed to, oh, um, you're going to leave the riding lawn no mower, you know, at no, no, no value, no cost to seller kind of a thing. You really don't want to have personal property as, as a rule included on your, on your purchase and sale. Um, but if it's specified that it doesn't have any value, you know, you want to definitely have some kind of documentation that it's going to be included if it's something that your buyer is expecting to receive with the sale. Um, if anything does get left, um, and one time I moved and I, when I went to unpack, I realized that I had left 
clean dishes in the dishwasher. I hadn't unloaded the dishwasher, but when I was packing, I was like, oh, I'll run this last load and then I'll pack those dishes. Didn't pack them because, you know, my set was incomplete. And I'm like, well, I'm just missing a few of this. They were in the dishwasher. So in that case, probably the buyer just went, oh, she left stuff in the dishwasher and probably went right into the trash. But, you know, whatever. This gives the buyer the right to dispose of any personal property that's left behind as as they see fit. Okay. And they can keep it or get rid of it, whatever they want. Um, I also, you know, if you're working with a buyer and you're working on your terms of your contract, I would talk to them about what they expect as far as standards for cleanliness for the property when they move in. Now, a lot of times after movers get done, there's some debris around and, um, you know, there used to be a phrase in a contract that was called broom clean. So basically it's swept out, but that was it. Um, a lot of times we get these, I get these calls right before closing. We went to do the walkthrough. We're closing in three days. It's supposed to be clean and the buyer feels it's not clean. Yeah. Then I called the listing agent and they said the seller had it cleaned or they did clean it. And to the seller, it's clean. To the buyer, it's not clean. So what exactly does it in this in one case, the buyer wanted the kitchen walls washed and the living room carpet professionally cleaned, and you know had some very specific ideas about what constituted clean. Now, if you've ever had a roommate or a spouse, um, and you're sharing a living space, you can probably relate to the fact that one person's idea of clean yeah. is not the other person's idea of clean. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All have different concepts of what that means. So you want to drill down, you know, ask those extra questions of your buyer. You know, what, you know, do you, do you feel like any part of the carpet needs to be professionally clean or gee, the windows look sparkling clean when we saw the house, that was a good thing, you know, or what, whatever, you know, if, if uh, sometimes people are dismayed when they go to move into a house and the pictures have been taken down and there are nail holes, you know, that kind of thing. Um, that's going to happen most of the times, but you don't want that three days before closing panic where it's not up to your buyer's standards and the buyer says, well, I don't want to move in. I don't want to close and move in until this is done. Um, then you're in a real scramble to get that done, um, you know, before closing. Right. Oh, here's Chris Brooks now. Oh, I just saw him. got some background noise anyway so that's oh hi sorry i just saw you in the waiting room sorry i just saw you in the waiting room that's all right i got booted earlier okay connection i was on the move okay well we're talking about the optional clause addendum 22d and we just finished talking about the sub subjective word cleaning having the seller clean a property for the buyer um want to make sure that if the buyer has specific expectations, say having some carpets professionally cleaned or, you know, windows washed or whatever, um, clean means different things to different people. A lot of times you get right up to closing and you go to do your walkthrough and buyer doesn't feel it's clean. I get these calls all the time. So um, another recommendation I have for you guys is do your walkthrough five days before closing so that if there are any discrepancies, gosh, you know, uh, this has happened recently too, where the seller left a piece of garden art. Okay. And it was like a gnome or something. It was cement to them. They were doing the buyer a big favor by leaving this decorative item. The buyer hated it. It was not to their taste at all. And they were very, you know, upset that the, you know, so it's so that it got left. Right. So it's one, one man's treasure might be another man's trash. So if you do your walkthrough five days out, then you've got a little bit of time to solve some of these problems before you get to the closing date. And if you're doing it the day before closing and your buyer digs in their heels and says, I don't want to close till this is solved, you, you know, it's a much bigger problem, right? You don't have the luxury of time to negotiate and get the problem solved. Okay, let's talk a minute about title insurance. 
So paragraph two deals with title insurance. Typically, you are not going to check either of these boxes. The boilerplate language on Form 21 provides for um, the current form of ALTA, that's American Land Title Association, um, title insurance. And standard insurance is usually used only with vacant land. Um, extended coverage is usually only needed if you need a survey. You probably won't know that until you get into the transaction. So the way it was explained to me, I've always thought of it since, is it's like bronze, silver, and gold. And what you've got in the boilerplate language of Form 21, your purchase and sale is silver. So 99% of the time, you're going to be going with a silver. You're not going to need the bronze, the standard, and you're not going to need the gold, the extended, except in specific circumstances. So most of the time, you're going to not, not check that at all. And if you do need extended coverage, title's going to tell you. And so you'll be able to change that with an addendum later on. Um, do fill out paragraph five, the utilities, um, the type of utilities that serve the property. And it doesn't hurt to verify with escrow whether it's septic or sewer because they will be reaching out to the seller directly for um, utility providers so that they, they can get estimated payoffs on any leanable utilities prior to closing. Those will be paid off and up to date um, from the seller's funds at the closing. And so you guys know that a lien is a financial encumbrance. It means that if there's uh, money owed that runs with the land, not the person. So it means that if there's a lien on a property, like from the HOA, from the federal uh, government via taxes for the judgment, that kind of thing has to be paid off at closing in order for a title to be cleared and be able to transfer to the buyer. So that's that's title and escrow's job and and um, That, that's what that means. But there have been cases where, you know, somebody bought a property and then realized that, oh, it's not on uh, public sewer, it's on septic, and that creates a huge problem. So do verify that with escrow, make sure they've gotten that information from the seller. It should be in the listing too, but you can't always, always trust that. It's a good thing to double check. Um, Insulation in paragraph six, that's for new construction only. So generally the insulation information is um, stapled to the inside of the garage near the breaker box, you know, the electrical panel. And it's part of the permitting process for the builder, so it's readily available. But you don't need to worry about that unless you've got new construction. Paragraph seven, um, is a place for the uh, boxes to be checked if anything is leased. We used to see a lot more, you know, lease propane, lease security systems, that kind of thing. Um, and this says seller has to give the buyer a copy of the lease within five days of mutual. And um, then the buyer has a chance, has five days to uh, review that and approve or disapprove. I don't think I've ever seen anybody disapprove a lease agreement and terminate a deal over that. Um, but if they're, the, still the, um, the buyer has that option. So buyer can either assume the lease or not assume the lease. Um, it, it depends on what the item is. Um, the only ones I really see with any regularity are propane tanks. And those leases are pretty easy to break. You know, uh, usually the when it's being sold, the buyer has the option to start up their own account and work with the same propane provider like CHS Propane. Or um, they can terminate it and select somebody else to um, provide their propane. But more often than not, they just are going to use the tank that's on the property. Um, 
And that's a lot if you're working out more, you know, rural areas in Snohomish, uh, you know, southeast, like Wrightville, you know, you see a lot more of the, the propane tanks. But there are parts of, you know, Gig Harbor moving out to Purdy where there are people who have propane tanks for um, power as well. Okay, Homeowners Association. We are in paragraph eight. And this gives the buyer a period of time to review all the homeowners, homeowners association particulars and determine if they're acceptable or not to them. But if nothing is written in here, the 10 days is the default for the seller to provide all this information to the buyer. And the buyer and you, the selling agent, should read these. Really important to see things like um, you know, their current operating budget, their financial statements. Um, I really like to read the meeting minutes because sometimes they'll talk about something like next year we may need a special assessment because we're going to have to re-roof building D or we're going to have to repave the parking lot or we're going to have to um, drain the retention pond and do a bunch of cleanup and it's going to cost $60,000, you know. And so, we, you know, let's put this on the agenda for next fall when we meet again and we need to revisit the bids at that point. So it kind of gives you some heads up of things that, that may be coming um, in Homeowners Association. I just got a, an email last night from a, one of our brokers whose clients had purchased a house a year ago. And the HOA has just imposed a special assessment um, a really high one, and they're really upset. And I don't know if there was anything in the documents that would have indicated that this was coming, but um, it, you don't want your clients taken by surprise. The other thing to really pay attention to is CCNRs, covenants, conditions, and restrictions. So the HOAs, those are typically recorded and they'd be on title, but you can always ask the title for them. Um, I When I was... In escrow, um, I often had agents who would email me and say, can you send me the CCRNRs for this property? I, even though they were hyperlinked in our um, on our title, I'd pull them out and send them to them to save them that little task. So these are important because they dictate a lot of different things about, you know, like with the association rules and regulations, um, just the operating systems of the HOA um, and the guidelines and what you can and can't do. Typically, it'll be something like, you know, you can't change the landscaping out in front without approval or you can't paint your house um, a different color without submitting a request to the board, right? You can't have, you know vehicles parked in your yard. You can't have RVs parked out in front for more than three days. I once had a deal fall apart. It was in a very nice neighborhood, rather expensive house. Buyers were crazy about it. They loved it. But once they saw the HOA docs, they rescinded over what was contained there because this house had a huge backyard and they wanted to put a shop out there. And the, the um, CCNR specifically um, precluded any outbuildings being um, put up in any of the the yards, they didn't they didn't they didn't want those at all. So the buyers decided they weren't going to buy the house and try to fight through the process with the HOA of getting an exception or something. They just decided to move on to find something else. So kind of kind of important to keep an eye on that timeline with your HOA, um, especially important. Um, when you have a you know a condo because they tend to have more um, more even more rules and regs but even if you have a you know regular residential development that has an HOA uh, definitely get you know pers pursue these a lot of times listing agents don't send the whole thing over they'll send some things and not others um, get get everything you you're contractually your buyers and contractually entitled to it so. Buyer does have five days to review these. <clears throat> At that time, then the the um, contingency 
expires, but they do have that five days to terminate and get their earnest money back if there's something in the HOA docs that um, are unacceptable to them. Um, par paragraph nine um, deals with any uh, transfer fees imposed by the HOA or, you know, condo association. Uh, could be a move-in fee, could be a move-out move fee. Um, usually escrow will get the statement of account from the HOA. And then this information along with, you know, is this, is a current owner up to date on their payments? You know, are there any special assessments? There's some other information contained in that form. But sometimes they will, there'll be a blank for the transfer fee and you can check to be paid by buyer or seller. So if the HOA doesn't check the box, then the seller would pay it unless you check the buyer box on this um, paragraph nine. I would always, as a buyer's agent, I'd always have the seller pay the transfer fee. Now, if the, sometimes HOAs will say, well, the, the buyer has to pay a move-in fee and the seller has to pay a move-out fee. Um, then that's that ha that happens, no matter what's checked here. Um, excluded items. This is kind of important because you really need to make sure you read your listing carefully to see if anything that you think would normally be included in the sale is being excluded by the seller. Um, and if the seller does want to remove, say, a chandelier, um, then they need to repair any damage to the property caused by that removal. So remember, we went over the items that are typically considered included in a sale. Um, some typical things that you see being excluded might be, um, you know, like drapes in the master bedroom that match the bedspread or something like that. Um, sometimes there are, um, oh, there's a shelf that my grandpa made and, you know, it has my cookbooks on it and I want to take the shelf, you know, sentimental value type items. So make sure that your buyer doesn't get their heart set on something that the seller's planning on taking. Any, any questions on that? One time I had a client who had a Franklin stove in the house and the buyer and I had the seller and the buyer really wanted that Franklin stove. So they asked for it in the offer. And then my client said, my seller said no. And honestly, it was worse than negotiating over the inspection. They went back and forth over that stove and I had some sentimental value from my client who was uh well let's just describe her as quirky and anyway she ended up the seller ended up then to convince the and you know that's an awkward thing to remove from a house right the way we solved it was that um the seller just gave the buyer a credit of three hundred dollars and said you know um you may go purchase your own stove, but I'm taking the one in the house. And it worked. So one of my phrases that I tell people occasionally is, sometimes if you've got a problem, you can throw a little money at it and make it go away. And while I don't like to, I really don't like to tell my brokers to give money away. Um, sometimes, you know, if you're looking at a $200 problem, you know, because the house isn't clean, like I'm talking about, versus closing on time and getting your $13,000 commission. Sometimes I can make that argument that maybe that, that $200 is well spent to go ahead and close on time. <clears throat> um, home warranty is to identify which of any of the home warranty plans will be used and who's going to pay for it. Um, it, it's great for both parties if you have a home warranty in place. Uh, I don't see so many being offered by listing agents routinely. Um, that used to be a fairly routine addition, uh, being included in the listing. But um, 
if you are selling to a friend or a relative, my advice is get that home warranty form. Then if the dishwasher gives out the first year, like happened to my sister, she was eternally grateful. They've been in the house about 10 years. She mentioned that the other day. I was so great that we got a new dishwasher, you know, because you gave us that warranty. Because it was an older dishwasher, it failed. They didn't have the parts for it, so they had to replace it. So it also gives the buyer a lot of peace of mind about the operating systems of the house that whatever, if something goes wrong, they're covered, right? Um, and sometimes things happen right after closing too. So um, where the buyer, you know, might be really upset that, oh, two days after closing, you know, the fridge quits working or whatever, then, you know, that's pretty upsetting. So if they know they've got that warranty, that that's a really big plus. Another time to use this warranty option is during your inspection um, negotiation. And once in a while, you know, there would be something the buyer's agent would say, well, the, the buyer's a little concerned, you know, the, the hot water heater, you know, and, and they know it's working, but, you know, it's eight and a half years old and hot water heaters usually last 10 or 12 years. And, you know, they're worried that, you know, it's going to quit working and he's going to be deployed this winter and the wife will be there with two little kids. And, you know, that would be a real problem. And, and I said, well, would they feel better if they had a home warranty? Well, yes, yes, they would. So at that time, the home warranty was like 375 which is a lot cheaper than getting them a new um hot water heater, which is about 800 to 1,000, right? So problem solved. Okay, they would feel a lot better. And then they were real happy and, you know, we just kept moving forward in the transaction. Um, so that that's my home warranty pitch. Um, if you can afford to do it for your clients, it it's a real plus. Or you can always just put that in there, ask the seller to pay a few hundred dollars towards a warranty. And then it, warranties are priced based on the size of the home and what the amenities. I mean, if they have, if it has a pool, if it has air conditioning, if it has ceiling fans, if it has, you know, what kind of heating system, um, everything pretty much has to be in operating order, you know, to be warrantied from the get-go. You can also order home warranties when you list a property and that covers the seller during the time of the listing. So that's kind of cool too. Okay, the last, there is a final blank on that page two of the optional clauses that's other. So this can be it for a lot of things you might want to add to the contract, but um, I don't really like to put anything too substantive in here. We just use it kind of for Disclosures, not for contractual obligations. So it would be something like, uh, um, I don't know, buyers related to buyer's agent, something like that. Or um, you don't want, certainly don't want to put anything that's like inspection related, like a um, uh, seller to have failed uh, windows with failed seals replaced or something you know don't don't do that um, better to put that on your inspection uh, response and they it's not going to get lost on this form okay how are we doing we're going to buzz through just a couple more forms and then i think i'm going to um, be able to wrap it up so 22t is a title contingency uh, I like to see this on every transaction um, because um, 22T gives a lot of protections about their title. <laughs> and some of them are really more relevant if you're on the other side of the mountains in this state. But there's a lot of stuff that's um, excluded on paragraph D of the Form 21. So this one uh, gives your buyer a stronger... Um, defense against any defects in title. So essentially buyer has five days to identify anything on the title 
that they object to anything about, you know, reserved oil and mineral rights, easements, conditions on title and so forth. And seller does have the right to try to cl clear those items, those exceptions on title prior to closing. So you'd want to um, consult with title and escrow to see if there's anything that was a red flag. And some title companies do send out a red flag report saying, you know, here's your title and here's here, here's a problem we've identified. Um, but as a new broker, you know, reading that title report, I was like, I have no idea what this means. So I would call up my title officer there on the front page of your title report and say, you know, can you go over this with me and tell me what I should be looking for? And that was a good way to learn what to look for. Um, other forms that you're always going to want to include are 41D. That's the, if you have an inspection on a property, you want to fill out that inspector referral disclosure form, 41D, and give your buyer three different options for inspectors. And if you need some advice on who to put down, you can ask your mentor. There are cards around the office for people who um, the broker, some of the brokers have used that have had good experiences. And that, de again, defrays your liability. 22J, if a property is built prior to 1978, you must use the 22J. This is a national requirement because of the lead-based paint um, potential hazard to hell. So you, you must use that if a, a property is built prior to 1978. Most of the time, the seller's not going to have any records on this, and the buyer will waive their right to inspect. But, you know, if, you're, if your buyer wants it, that is definitely available to, to them that they can do have it inspected for any presence of lead-based paint. And really, lead-based paint is only dangerous if you, like, are stirring it up. You know, if you're sanding it and you're not wearing a mask. Um, I, at this point in time, most of the lead-based paint has been painted over. Um, but anyway, put that put that on every um, everyone where it's required. 22K is your utilities addendum. You're going to ask escrow to pay off those leanable utilities. So always complete that. We already talked about um, 22T, the title addendum. Um, certainly, if you've got a septic system or a well, you're going to be using the appropriate um, forms for, for those. There is a well addendum and there is a septic addendum. And you will, those are county, the septic addendums are county specific. So you're going to want to use the one that, um, if you're in Pierce County, use the Pierce. Septic, if you're in King, there's King. There's one for Mason. There's one for Kitsap. Um, there's not one for every single county in Washington, but most of the places you're going to be working, there's going to there's going to be a form for that. Okay, what questions do you have for me? Clear as mud. I have I have a question on the. On the example you gave earlier where the buyer backed out because uh, he wanted to install a shop in the backyard, is that going to affect his earnest money or is there a way? Well, because he was exercising a contingency, you know, he had the right to review those HOA docs. And if he didn't like what he found in there, he could disapprove them and exit and get his earnest money. If he let that time elapse, that 10 days, if it came and went, then he and then he said, "Oh, I want out," and he didn't have a contingency to use. Then he would be in default, and he would sacrifice his owner's money. Well, make sure your buyers understand that, you know, if they change their mind and they default on their contract without a contingency, their earnest money is at risk. Okay. That's why it's important. Okay. It's good that you, you know, are working on. Getting this knowledge on understanding the contingencies and what they mean to your buyer, that was a good question. What is oh. what form did you say? Uh, what form did you say you need to include for the disclosures when re recommending an inspector? 
Oh, it's 41D. 41D, okay. 41D, D for disclosure. And it just basically has, you know, three blocks for you to put down the names of three different inspectors. And it, for there was a period of time uh, where people were, you know, putting down their brothers-in-law or maybe uh, the name of a inspection company where they had a financial interest, where they were, you know, getting paid something on, you know, on the side. So, you know, this was kind of part of the crackdown on that. You know, you have to use inspectors who are licensed uh, with the state. And um, if you have a personal relationship with them, if you're related to them, then you need to disclose that. For me, I don't have any relationship with any inspectors, so I would just put, you know, have referred to clients in the past or, you know, has worked with other brokers in my firm, something like that to describe the relationship because I didn't have any other personal connection to them. So it's okay. just another, another form that was generated in the interest of consumer protection. Gotcha. Yeah, yesterday we were going over some stuff in command and it sounds like when you create an opportunity, you describe the type of transaction and it will give you like the list of uh, exactly. forms needed, right? That's probably exactly. our best resource to to yeah. check which ones we need. Okay. For sure. Great. Yeah. But right after the break, we were talking about the fact that you could not only create a test transaction in Transaction Desk, but you could also upload a test transaction into command to, you know, practice that um, working in that format. Awesome. That, that's a great resource. Love it. Yeah. Gwen suggested that. I thought it was a really good idea. Because, yeah, you know, like great. everything, the more you work on a platform, you know, the more familiar you get and the easier it is. You know, your eye automatically gets trained to go to the different fields you need. And you're, oh, yeah, here, click on that. So it's right. good, good to practice that. And not be doing it at like 10 o'clock at night when you're tired and stressed out. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Do it when you've got lots of time. And then if you have questions about it, you can get those questions answered so that you can refine your process or be ready for the, the real deal. Makes sense. Awesome. Okay, well, I am so proud of you guys for attending today and broadening your knowledge base so that you really understand the forms and... Um, can explain it to your clients and I hope that you both are using them very soon. <laughs> yes, very <laughs> soon. Interactions. And next time, um, the fourth Wednesday of the month, we'll be talking about inspection forms and the process. And I hope to see you guys then. Sounds Thanks great. so much for being here. Have a great Bye. rest of the day. Right, you too. Bye. Thanks, Susan. Thank you.